Tonight we continue our look at Jesus in the Old Testament by wrapping up our brief survey of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, which we know as Genesis through Deuteronomy. And before we get into the final book of Deuteronomy, I want to look at where we have been from a bird's eye view. I want us to kind of consider the specific things that we've addressed, stepping back and seeing how they fit into the larger picture, just to remind us that the story through these five books, the key thesis is Jesus Christ. If you remember, at one point we looked at the purpose for which God created anything. Why did God ever decide to make the world and make humanity and make trees and squirrels and all the rest? Why did He do so? He did so because, we read, He had promised His Son an inheritance. Remember the Scripture says on several occasions, things like, all things were created by Him, referring to Christ, and for Him. And the purpose for His Son, that He created all these things, was He had promised Him an inheritance. An inheritance of people who would worship Him. Remember, we are predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son so that He would be the firstborn of many brethren. And we looked at how that's a patriarchal uh, word describe or, or concept describing the younger brothers bowing down before the elder brother. Jesus is that elder brother and humanity was created to serve Him. And so God had to create a world on which to place these humans who would serve His Son. Therefore, we have in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And all of the other aspects of the universe, right there in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 3 brings us to humanity rebelling against its Creator. Mankind saying, I will not obey you, I will do what I want to do and God pronouncing curse upon the entire created order, including mankind, because of their rebellion. So already, by the time we get to Genesis chapter 3, we have God's universe made, His crowning achievement, His, His most significant creation in human beings, and those human beings committing sin and incurring the wrath and the judgment of God. That's the story of everything that matters to point to Christ. And we have, in Genesis 3, verse 15, the first statement of hope. Think about it from this perspective. God has created the inheritance, or at least set in seed form the inheritance, because He gives the command to Adam and Eve to multiply and fill the earth. But already, just three chapters in, they have become tainted. The inheritance has become worthless. God's not going to give to His Son a sinful humanity. So what is God going to do? Is He going to simply throw it all away? Is He going to condemn them and forget the whole thing? No, because we've also looked at how Christ is the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. That also was part of God's plan before He ever set the world in motion. Remember Peter saying to the Jews, you hung Him on a cross through the uh, faculty of the Romans, but this was all the foreordained, predetermined plan of God. He is the one who would be slain before the foundation of the world. So even the sin of Adam and Eve was part of the ultimate plan of God. And in Genesis 3.15, we have the first promise of the Redeemer pointing to Christ that He would come. He would be the seed of the woman who would crush the serpent, undoing what the serpent had done in leading this inheritance into sin. By the time we get to Genesis 3.15, we have all we need for the, for the coming of Christ. We have creation, we have mankind, we have sinful mankind, and we have the promise of the Redeemer who would come. From that point forward, the story of the Bible, and in particular the story of the Old Testament, becomes centered on the theme of sin 
and righteousness and redemption. The stage is set for the coming of Christ in all of those areas. We traced through and we saw how Noah was a man who found grace in God's eyes. The rest of the world of mankind had become corrupt. They were evil and God was fed up with them. And he said, I'm going to destroy them all. I'm going to send a flood and submerge them in judgment. But he saved Noah and his family in the ark, pointing to Christ that final judgment is coming. God will destroy all those who have rebelled against him. But all who enter into the ark, that is, who trust in Christ, who believe the gospel, will be saved from that coming wrath. Judgment, salvation, right there in the story of Noah. Then came Abraham, the great patriarch. He's the one who was given the promises. Most significantly, in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. As the Apostle Paul tells us, that promise was a direct point to Christ. Christ is the seed. Christ is the offspring in whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And how is that fulfilled? By the gospel being proclaimed in every nation under heaven. And as people come to Christ, as they believe the gospel, Abraham's offspring, Jesus Christ, is the instrument by which God is blessing every family, every people group on the planet. In Genesis 15, we saw how justification by faith is introduced. Abraham believed God, and God counted that as righteousness. The whole problem created in Genesis chapter 3 is that we are sinful. Abraham found the one way for sinners to become righteous. To believe the promise of God, he was justified by his faith, pointing to justification by faith in Jesus Christ. So, if we have the promise to Abraham being fulfilled in Christ, then why doesn't the Scripture just jump from Genesis to Matthew with the coming of Christ? Why Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy? Why the law? Why the covenant with Israel? If Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. Well, the Apostle Paul anticipates that you would ask that question. Good question. He knows you're going to ask that. And in chapter 3 of his book to his letter to the Galatians, after describing Abraham and his seed being Christ, he says, why the law then? It was added because of transgressions. And skipping down to verse 25, verse 24 rather, therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. We've talked about that. The law, the covenant given to Moses and to Israel was to point the need to Christ. It was to expose sin. It was to arouse sin and cause the Jews. And by extension, we who understand what's going on with the Jews to realize we are unrighteous before God. We need a Savior. We need atonement for our sins. We need some other way to become righteous. That's why God gave the law and enacted the covenant with the Israelites to point out sin. So as you read through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and indeed the rest of the Old Testament, which is primarily the outworking of the covenant God established with Israel, you should have in your thinking all the way through that this is to get to Christ. All of these accounts, all of these stories, the prophecies, the law as it's revealed, it's all to show that according to our works, we are incapable of becoming righteous and inheriting the blessing. It all points to Jesus Christ. So then we began to look at Exodus, and if you remember at the end of Genesis, after Abraham, you've got his son Isaac and his son Jacob and his 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. The rest of Genesis is heading toward establishing Israel in slavery to Egypt in Exodus chapter 1. All of those accounts with Potiphar, Joseph being thrown in jail because of Potiphar's wife, 
and interpreting dreams and the cupbearer of Pharaoh and the baker of Pharaoh, all of that is to get to the place where in Exodus chapter 1, 400 years have passed and now Israel is a large nation in slavery to Egypt so that God could deliver Israel from slavery, which becomes the chief metaphor for our salvation. Just as God delivered Israel from Egypt, we are delivered from slavery to sin. And in the book of Exodus, as we saw, after the, uh, dec- after the Ten Commandments, after the uh, emancipation of the Jews, then we have the covenant established. The law given, the Ten Commandments, which were the stipulations by which if Israel obeyed them, they would be blessed. If they disobeyed them, they would be cursed. The law is given to point to Christ exposing sin. And then at the, toward the end of Exodus, we saw the establishment of the tabernacle. And there, if you remember, we saw how blessed the Israelites were that the presence of God, His very manifest presence, was there among the people. And that's what separated them from all of the other nations on earth. God dwelt among the Israelites. But the other side of that was, He was in a room that had a very clear warning, do not enter, symbolizing to the Jews, God's here among us, but we can't get there. We don't have access Jesus Christ tore down the veil with His crucifixion and He came and dwelt among us. In fact, by His Spirit, He indwells us even to this day. Thus, the tabernacle pointed to Christ. Then we have the book of Leviticus, which brings to our attention a couple of other aspects of Christ. One is, the only way to get to God is through a mediator, a holy acceptable mediator that can dwell in the presence of God. The priestly system was established. God called Aaron, Moses' brother, as the high priest and his descendants to be those mediators by which, through representation, the Jews could approach God, but only after they had been cleansed and purified and performed all the sacrifices. And then only one day a year was the high priest actually able to enter in to the presence of God. Jesus Christ is the high priest who enters into the heavenly tabernacle and there dwells in the presence of God on our behalf with endurance. Always he is there to make a sacrifice for us. The other thing we learn in Leviticus is the need for there to be death to atone for sins. The wages of sin is the wages of sin is death. The sacrifices the priest had to perform over and over and over again. Morning sacrifices, evening sacrifices. I mean, can you imagine if your calling was to be a priest in Israel and all day long you spent your time slaughtering animals, emptying out the insides, burning this, burning that, pouring blood here, sprinkling blood there. It would not be the kind of job that too many of us would sign up for on a regular basis. Some of you like that kind of thing, and you'd be okay. But for the rest of us, that's not the uh, vocation that we're interested in. But what that was was a daily reminder of sin and the fact that we need a substitution. The Jew didn't die. The animal died. Somebody, some living thing must die to atone for sin. And so all of those sacrifices showed the people of Israel they require a substitutionary death. The problem was, all of those animals multiplied by the millions upon millions could not atone for even one person's single sin because they were just animals. Then we get into the book of Numbers, and we saw last week about how uh, Moses lifted up the serpent, and that foreshadowed the coming of Christ. We didn't look at this, but a significant story in the book of Numbers is how the Israelites were right there at the edge of the promised land. They were about to enter into Canaan. And they send in spies to scout out the land to see how they might overtake this. And those spies came back and they said, we can't. They're too big and powerful. We will lose. We would be fools to try to enter in there. And God was very angry by that because he was going to take care of it. And he sentenced the entire adult generation to death. They wandered in the wilderness. Uh, Sinai was a mere 11-day journey from the promised land, and it took them 40 
years because God sent them wandering around until that generation had all died. Not one of you will enter except for this, those two spies and uh, Mo, well, not even Moses, right? Joshua and Caleb who believed that they could, with the power of God, enter in. The rest of them were all judged in the wilderness. And this becomes one of the New Testament's favorite uh, metaphors or analogies for the call to perseverance for the Christian. That we must, if we are going to enter the promised land, persevere in faith, believing the promises of God. He will do what He said He will do. He will forgive our sins. He will be gracious with us. We must hang on to that and not be like those Jews who fell in the wilderness. That story takes place in the book of Numbers. Which leads us to the book of Deuteronomy. This is Moses' farewell speech. This is his final sermon. This is that second generation, the young generation, the new generation, all of those who were under the age of 20, whose parents were now all dead because of God's judgment. Now the new generation is ready to take the promised land. And Moses is preaching this message to call them to faithfulness and endurance and trust so that they will not suffer the same consequences as their parents. And so he recounts the whole history of what has transpired for Israel up to this point. And he reminds them of the law, reminds them of the Ten Commandments and all the other laws they must keep. And he calls them over and over and over again to obey, to obey, to obey, so that God will bless them. And in the midst of his appeal, we're going to look at a couple of significant aspects of God's relationship with Israel and how they foreshadow Christ and the new covenant. And we're going to pick up in chapter 10, beginning with verse 12, where Moses says this, Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in His ways and love Him, and to serve the Lord God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the Lord's commandments and His statutes, which I am commanding you today for your good. Behold, to, you, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, and the earth and all that is in it. Yet on your fathers did the Lord set His affection to love them, and He chose their descendants after them, even you above all peoples, as it is to this day. So Moses is reminding them, this is your task. Love God, serve Him, obey Him, and remember your privileged position. God chose you. He didn't choose the Canaanites or the Midianites. He didn't choose any of those other nations. He set His affection on you and on your forefathers. So remember the terms of the covenant established back at Sinai. You will be to me, the Lord said, a people for my own possession, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. You will experience all of this blessing and this close intimacy with God if you will simply obey. Remember how much He loves you and has set His affection on you. And then He gives this command. Verse 16. So, circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer says, those of you who are males, you bear the mark in your body of the covenant. You bear circumcision on your flesh, but you are an obstinate people. You will not turn your neck and follow the ways of the Lord. That has not been your practice, but you need to change that. You must circumcise the foreskin of your heart so that you change yourself into the kind of people who desire to please God, to love God, to appreciate His special grace to you. What's the problem with that? There is no way they could do that. He is calling them to do the impossible. You change your will. You change your heart. You change your desires and your affection so that you love the Lord. And stop being so stubborn and obsolete. And they couldn't do it. They never did it. You read through the rest of the history of Israel and it's repeated over and over and over and over and over again. She's described as a woman, a married woman, 
who pursues every man under every tree, anywhere and everywhere. Whoredom is the word that is used and the harlotry for the nation of Israel. They committed idolatry at every turn. There's very few periods of time where they were faithful to the terms of the covenant. David led the people in righteousness for a while, but even he was a murderer and an adulterer. And of course, his son Solomon led Israel into widespread idolatry, and king after king, even after, the, after Israel was divided into two kingdoms, they all eventually succumbed to the temptation to idolatry and suffered the wrath of God. He says, circumcise your heart at the beginning of entering the promised land. But they didn't. And the consequences for breaking God's covenant were severe. Now, I'm not going to read all of this in Deuteronomy 28, but just enough to remind us, to give us the flavor of the ramifications for Israel for failing to keep God's law. Beginning in verse 15, we read, But it shall come about, if you do not obey the Lord your God, to observe to do all His commandments and His statutes, with which I charge you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall you be shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the offspring of your body and the produce of your ground, the increase of your herd and the young of your flock. Cursed shall be you be when you come in. Cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send upon you curses, confusion, and rebuke in all you undertake to do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly on account of the evil of your deeds because you have forsaken me. These are the terms that Moses lays out to the people at the beginning of their entrance into the promised land. If you do not obey, everything you set your hand to do, God will curse. When you're coming in and when you're going out, I mean, that pretty much leaves standing still, right? Those are the only times they wouldn't be cursed. Everything, it's universal. Whatsoever they pursue and do and are interested in, in the, in the kneading bowl, in their food, even their animals will be af afflicted. God's punishment will rest upon Israel if she does not obey everything written in the law. The law was given to reveal sin. Every time they experienced judgment, Israel should have been reminded of their sin and called out for a Savior. That's the point. So God, through Moses, explains to Israel what is coming for them, and he pronounces this curse on them. And he says in chapter 30, beginning in verse 15, this is Moses calling Israel with sort of one last desperate plea for obedience. He says this, See, I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, to keep His commandments and His statutes and judgments, that you may live and multiply, and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess it. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land where you are crossing the Jordan to enter it and possess it. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying His voice and holding fast to Him. For this is your life and the length of your days, that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. So Moses makes this final appeal. I'm putting before you the opportunity to have life abundantly in a way you can hardly begin to imagine. I mean, the opposite of all those curses, God had pronounced the blessing. If you obey, I will bless you in your coming and going. As you come in, as you go out, in everything you do, everything you set your hand to, I will bless you. I mean, God held out to Israel paradise. Anything you and I could ever hope and dream to have, 
he held out as a blessing to Israel if they would obey. But Moses says, there's also the other side, the curse. And I am setting before you in this law your choice. Choose life. Serve God. Obey Him and experience all that God has laid before you. And He calls heaven and earth to bear witness. This is serious business. I'm calling the cosmic uh, scope, everything in the universe, everything up there and everything down here, everything that's watching and listening today, I'm calling as a testimony to you that you have the choice. Choose life or choose death. Choose blessing or choose cursing. He calls another witness in chapter 31. We begin back in verse 23. He commissioned Joshua, the son of Nun, and said, Be strong and courageous, for you shall bring the sons of Israel into the land which I swore to them, and I will be with you. And it came about when Moses finished writing the words of this law in a book until they were complete, that Moses commanded the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may remain there as a witness against you. Everywhere the Jews went as they traveled around with the tabernacle and eventually in the temple, whenever that Ark of the Covenant was present, inside were the very words of the covenant, the law. And it is a testimony, it is a witness to remind Israel they are always under the threat of curse or on the throes of blessing depending upon their obedience. And so when they saw the ark, though it was also the throne of God, inside were these terms, the contract, if you will, to call to their attention, God's curse rests upon you if you do not obey. That's why it's called the ark of testimony or the witness. And Moses was instructed to put the testimony there before them. You know, there's one other aspect of this that is enlightening and sad. Moses was the representative. He was the mediator. He was the leader for Israel. He was the lawgiver. He was the one who continually interceded for Israel when they sinned. He was the one proclaiming these truths. He was the one that should have known better because he spoke face to face with God. He understood the terms. He's begging and pleading with Israel to be obedient. And yet, you remember his tragic end to his ministry. Listen to this account in chapter 32, verse 48. The Lord spoke to Moses that very same day, saying, Go up to this mountain of the Abram, Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, opposite Jericho, and look at the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the sons of Israel for a possession. Then die on the mountain where you ascend, and be gathered to your people, as Aaron your brother died on, on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people, because... You broke faith with me in the midst of the sons of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin because you did not treat me as holy in the midst of the sons of Israel. For you shall see the land at a distance, but you shall not go there into the land which I am giving to the sons of Israel. Here is the representative of Israel, the lawgiver himself, and he could not obey God. He could not keep God. Moses was forbidden to enter the promised land because of his disobedience. The repeated refrain and the message of Deuteronomy is Israel is called to perfect obedience to God if she is to be, to be blessed, and she did not and cannot receive blessing. She can only receive cursing because she cannot keep the terms of the covenant. Even Moses was judged guilty by God and punished, forbidden to enter the promised land. The old covenant was established 
to point the way to the new covenant in Christ. So as we get to the New Covenant Scriptures, as we get to the arrival of Christ, we find hope. We find the promised land being attainable because of the work of Christ. Back in chapter 30 of Deuteronomy, there is a glimmer of this hope. There is some pointing toward the time when God would accomplish righteousness for His people. Moses rehearses what's going to happen for Israel. They are going to break the covenant and they are going to be punished just as God said they would. And then in verse 6 he says, Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, so that you may live. Earlier it was you circumcise your heart. You change your desire but they can't. But here is a glimpse of hope that God would be the one who would change hearts. God would circumcise the foreskin of their hearts. He would give them the desire to obey and to love Him. And we read in the New Testament, Philippians 3.3, Paul says, We are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. We are those who have been circumcised in the heart, those who believe the gospel. We who are part of the new covenant. He says to the Colossians in chapter 2, verse 11, And in Him, speaking of Christ, you also were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. God in Jesus and the cross brought about that circumcision of the heart. Romans chapter 2, 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. In the new covenant, in the work of Christ on the cross and the subsequent pouring out of his Holy Spirit, We are the ones whose hearts have been changed. We are the ones receiving this promised blessing back in Deuteronomy chapter 30. God will circumcise your heart at the coming of His Son. Galatians chapter 3, which we read earlier, there is another significant teaching here. Jesus Christ took upon Himself the curse of the Old Covenant. In chapter 3, verse 10, Paul writes, For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Paul's just saying what I've been saying, what Moses said. You must obey everything in the law if you're going to be righteous by the law. Well, the obvious implication of that for everyone is, every Jew You're under the curse because you haven't kept it. But then in verse 13, he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. For the Jew, this was the testimony of hope. Every Jew should have understood they are under the curse of the law because they haven't kept it, but Paul is saying Christ took the curse for them, suffered the consequences for them. That applies to us as Gentiles as well. Though we were never under the curse of the Old Covenant, we are under the ultimate curse of sin and judgment. As the New Testament tells us, every sinner is liable to the eternal wrath of God. And Paul says to the church at Corinth, He became sin for us so that we could become righteousness. He took upon Himself our sin and our wrath and our judgment just as He took upon Himself the curse that was upon the Jews for breaking the covenant. And now there's another section, a very interesting and intriguing and in some ways difficult section of Deuteronomy that I want to look at. Chapter 30. Verse 11 
and following. This is after Moses says that God will circumcise your heart. In verse 11 he says, For this commandment which I command you today is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of reach. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will go up to heaven for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will cross the sea for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it? But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may observe it. What Moses is saying here is, this command to life, this opportunity to be blessed and receive life, it's not way out there. You don't have to go up to heaven and get the path to life. You don't have to go to the depths of the sea to find out how to be pleasing to the Lord and how to receive His blessing. It's in your mouth every time you pronounce the Shema, every time you quote the Old Testament law, every time you speak the Old Covenant commands and you memorize the Scripture, the Jews, he's saying, you all are speaking those words of life. How do I live before the Lord? Keep His commandments. How do I experience His blessing? Obey Him. And every time the Jews rehearsed the law, they had right there the means to receive God's blessing. The problem is, every time they recited those commands, they were also exposing their own sin because they couldn't keep it. In their self-righteousness, they thought they were keeping it, but before God, they were not keeping it. Well, Paul takes this passage in Romans chapter 10 and gives it a new covenant interpretation. And he quotes the words that I just read with some commentary along the way and draws the line straight to Jesus Christ. Chapter 10, verse 5, he says, For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. That is very, very bad news. If your hope of living is by righteousness of the law, you have no hope of living. You have only death and punishment. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. And here he quotes Deuteronomy. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? And now he gives us commentary. That is, to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. The word to life, the path to life, the ability to live, it's right here in your mouth and in your heart. But this time he's not referring to the old covenant law. Now the object has changed. He says, that is, what word is near you and in your mouth and your heart? That is the word of faith which we are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. The problem that began in Genesis chapter 3, the need for righteousness that which separates man from God, that which brings about God's wrath and judgment, that righteousness has been satisfied. It has been presented to us through the word of faith that is believing the gospel. So when Moses is calling to Israel and saying, it's not that hard, it's here, you have the path of life. How does he get to Christ? How does Paul take that and get to Christ? The law was given to point the Jews to Christ, exposing their sin, revealing their sin, provoking their sin, so they would call upon the coming Messiah and receive righteousness. And the righteousness of faith is the one who calls out and says, Jesus is Lord, God raised Him from the dead, and now the person who proclaims that and believes that is declared just before God, declared righteous, and receives salvation. Everything in the Old Covenant in fact, everything in the Old Testament was given to get to the New Covenant in the New Testament. 
One last passage as we wrap this up. Hebrews chapter 8, where the new covenant is portrayed in contrast to the old. Again, I want to emphasize, as you're reading the Old Testament Scriptures, you must have in your mind, this gets us to the new covenant. This was written to get us to Christ and the blessings that would come with Christ in the new covenant. Now, as we look at what the writer of Hebrews has to say in these first few verses of chapter 8, listen for all of the references and allusions to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He says, now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest. We have a high priest. That should draw to mind Aaron. What kind of high priest is he talking about? He tells us at the end of chapter 7, verse 26, it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Here, in contrast to the old covenant priesthood, Jesus is our holy an undefiled high priest who offered not animals, but himself. We have a high priest who has taken his seat. Remember last week we talked about how the priests of the Old Covenant didn't sit down because there was always more sacrificing to do, more atoning to do? Jesus took a seat. He finished his work. He completed his task. And he took his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens. This high priest is also the king. This high priest is also in the position of authority at the right hand of the high king. Think Joseph, who was put in the right hand position of Pharaoh, overseeing everything that happened in Egypt. No one could buy or sell, go in or go out without approval from Joseph. Pharaoh was the king, but he transferred all authority to Joseph. God is the king of the universe. He gave all authority to his son who sits at his right hand. A minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle. There is a tabernacle that is the real one, the substantive one, the one that was put in the middle of Israel that they packed up and moved around. That had a purpose. It was to point to Christ. It was to point to the heavenly tabernacle where Christ is a priest. It's the one which the Lord pitched, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, so it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. He offered himself, the only sacrifice that would truly atone for anyone's sins. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve as a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. We need to know those terms as we read the Old Testament. Everything in the Old Testament is to serve as a copy, a picture, an image, an outline, a shadow, a vague description of Jesus Christ. Everything in the Old Testament is to give us some information, some preconceived notion of the ultimate fulfillment in Christ. The tabernacle, the temple, the priesthood, all of that were copies and shadows of the ultimate fulfillment coming in Christ. Just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle, for, he says, quote, see that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. Why was God so concerned to give all of those details, page after page after page of details, on how Moses too was to construct this tabernacle? 
It was because every part of it reflected the ultimate tabernacle in the heavens. If we don't have the furniture arranged just the way it was described, if we don't have the altar where the altar is, and the laver where the laver is, and the candlestick, and the veil, and the holy place, and the holy of holies, then we have a distorted picture of what it takes to enter into the presence of God. All of those minute details were given specifically by God to Moses because they all pointed to his son. And God did not want Moses to mess it up. The picture must be accurate. The need for the coming of Christ and his atoning work and his priestly work had to be described very accurately. And then he says, but now he, speaking of Christ again, has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted on better promises. There was an old covenant. It was a good covenant because its purpose was to point to the new covenant. But now Christ has come and He is the mediator just as Moses was a mediator. Christ is a mediator of a new covenant which is a vastly superior covenant to the covenant given at Israel. Why is it superior? Read on. For in that first covenant, if it had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. There was a flaw in the first covenant. Do you know what the flaw of the first covenant was? There was no power to obey. God held out the requirements, but He did not give the people the ability to obey that covenant. Why? Because it was never intended to be a covenant that led them to righteousness. It was a covenant to lead them to sin, to show them their need of His Son, Jesus Christ. For finding fault with them, and there he qualifies, a very important qualification. Ultimately, it wasn't the covenant that was flawed. It was the people. They couldn't keep it. He says, and now quoting Jeremiah, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and will write them on their hearts. Now in the new covenant, instead of it being external, instead of being written on tablets of stone and a scroll and placed in the Ark of the Covenant as a constant testimony against their sin, I will circumcise their hearts. I will give them internally the desire and the will to obey. That's why this covenant will be so much better. They will have the inclination to serve me in that new covenant. I will start on the inside, not on the outside. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Do you notice what is missing from anything in this new covenant? There is no if. I will be their God and they will be my people if they obey, if they keep all the commands, all the statutes. You don't find that in the New Covenant. What you find is, as members of the New Covenant, I am their God and they are my special people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them. Nobody has to be taught in the New Covenant to know the Lord. Now it doesn't say that we don't have to know about the Lord. The only way you can get in the New Covenant is to know about the Lord. But when he talks about knowing the Lord, he's using it in that intimate way. That knowledge of the Lord that is portrayed in a husband and wife relationship that intimacy that is spoken of when Jesus says, there will be those on that day that I will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Now does that mean that Jesus is unaware of some people? We, I thought he was omniscient. Doesn't he know everything? Yes, he knows everyone in the sense of having cognitive awareness of them. But he does not 
know everyone in an intimate marriage-like sense. That's what Jeremiah was talking about. That's what God was talking about. You won't have to teach people in this new covenant to know the Lord. Why? Because the only way you can get in this new covenant is to know the Lord. You have to marry the Son of God if you're going to be in this covenant. You have to believe the gospel. Under the old covenant, you were in the covenant by virtue of birth. You were born into it. Every Jewish child was part of the covenant whether he liked it or not. And he grew up without his own choosing to enter this covenant. He grew up bound to its terms. And so every young Jewish boy grew up, was told, here's the law. This is why that passage is so important in Deuteronomy. Put it on the frontals of your forehead, write it on your wrist, put it on your door, everywhere and you're up and down when you're walking along the way. You must, fathers, you must teach your children to obey. Why was that so emphatic? Because every boy grew up in the covenant. And if he did not know the terms of the covenant, he would very well break the covenant and suffer the consequences. Moses is saying, look, if you want to preserve the next generation, teach your kids to obey the law. Didn't do good. They didn't obey, but that was the command. And so a person could be born into this covenant and grow up under its terms, and they didn't choose to be in that covenant, and they would break the covenant and not be intimate with God, but be his enemy. But everybody in the new covenant has an intimate relationship with God. You can't get into the covenant. You cannot be a participant of the new covenant unless you believe the gospel and thereby submit to Christ as Savior and Lord. But the greatest promise that makes the new covenant so much better than the old is verse 12. For I will be merciful to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. Under the old covenant, the Jews were reminded every single day of their lives, we are sinners, we are under God's wrath. We are sinners, we are under God's wrath. We have to bring the sacrifices, we have to go to the priest, we are under his wrath. And when they were exiled, when God brought judgment through Babylon and Assyria and the rest and sent them into exile, they lived every day of their life knowing they had been cut off from the presence of God, separated from the promised land because of their sin. God remembered the sins of the Jews, every one of them. But in the new covenant, God says, I don't remember their sins. I will be merciful to them and I will throw their sins as far as the east is from the west. So we step back and we look at the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We have the setting of the stage for the coming of the Christ. We have the sin which produces the need for his atoning work. We have the promises made to Abraham which are fulfilled in Christ. And we have the establishment of the Old Covenant with its law, which brings blessing or cursing based upon obedience. And the rest of those books declaring loudly and clearly that mankind is sinful and that according to their own works of righteousness, they will not and cannot receive the blessing of God. And every single page in those first five books are a giant arrow pointing to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who would bring about the new covenant, which brings forgiveness of sin and the presence of the living God in us through His Holy Spirit. On the road to Emmaus, when Jesus is speaking with the disciples in Luke 24, and when he says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he taught them about himself. That's what he taught them. It all speaks of me. Moses wrote about me. So I want to encourage you from here to eternity, from now on, every time you read the Old Testament, every time you read these first five books, think Jesus Christ. 
They're all about Jesus.